Mark 10. Twenty-nine to thirty. Reading, and Jesus answered and said, "Verily I say unto you, there is no man that have left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses." and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. So the person asked, now put your, pick up, put your finger there and turn, let's um, turn to Mark chapter 12, verse 25. Mark chapter 12, verse 25. All right, let's read verse 25, reading. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. So this person asked, Pastor, Jesus taught that there are no marriages in heaven. If there are no marriages in heaven, how is it that in the earlier passage, Jesus promised an hundredfold, that includes brethren, sisters, and mothers, and children. He said, I was, under, I was under, of the understanding that there are no marriages in heaven. How can they be children? So if God promises no marriage in heaven, how is it that God says, well, there'll be a hundredfold of this, right? And in eternity. Okay, so how would you answer that? Actually, uh, you want to answer, Thomas? Mm, don't know. No? You can try, all right? So Julius asked you this question, all right? Say, Julius, Julius, good question. I'm not convinced that I am correct by saying that, well, these are just Christian brethren in heaven. Chapter 10, right? Look at Mark chapter 10, verses 29 to 30. So he says, I'm not convinced. Okay, because there is the word, or children. If there are no marriages, no brothers and sisters, we can understand, but children, right? No marriages, how come there are people still having children, giving birth to children? Okay, so you're not convinced with your own answer. All right, someone else try. Howard, oh, let's ask the teens. Uh, I asked Cornelius this morning, but another teen. Uh, Josiah, how do you answer that? Not sure as well. Okay, last one. Uh, Gillian, you need to shout a bit because of the mask. All right, so Gillian says, the first part, all the brethren and sisters or father, mother, wife or, wife or children, now refers to now. How do you know it's now, Gillian? It means on earth, now as in on earth. How do you know? Because of verse 30, but he shall receive an hundredfold now, not just now, but in this time. Okay, so this question um, it's easily answered. We, if we read it carefully, like Gillian did, this hundredfold of all these people is about now in this time. Okay? Now in this time, houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, and children, and lands. But, and in the world to come, what about the world to come, Thomas? Is this about the world to come? What will you receive in the world to come? eternal life all right so don't mix up the two the eternal part in heaven is eternal life the manifold 
is talking about replacements on earth. Okay? So, now in fact, if you were to turn to Luke chapter 18, it's very clear as well, Luke chapter 18, the other, the other account, Luke chapter 18. All right, so parents, you better start thinking of the application, all right? Let's read 18, 28 to 30, reading. 28 to 30, then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive many fold more in this present time, and in the world to come, everlasting life. All right, so there is a clear separation. Yes, there is no marriages in heaven. People won't be giving birth, getting married, and having children in heaven. Christ said there won't be marriages in heaven. Well, one of the things that I want to emphasize now, and I hope parents, you think of the applications. Now, one of the things that the, the Christian must realize, there is no marriages in heaven. Today, people long to be married, want to be married, at all costs, and they will even marry unbelievers because they just want to get, ma get married. Now, do you realize that marriage is only temporal on earth? Some people say, well, I want, to, I want to have some eternal bliss. I want to get married. I want to know some heaven on earth, eternal bliss. Eternal bliss does not include marriage. There is no marriage. Marriage is in heaven. Those who long to be married and want to be married at all costs, you are pursuing something, desiring something that God says is not that important. If it was so important, it would be in eternity as well. Right? So I'm not saying marriage is evil. Paul made it very clear. If God wills for you to be married, you should be married. If God wills for you to be single, it is good. There are many things that singles can do that marriage, married people will be hampered from doing. All right? They have other responsibilities, not that they are in an evil state. Right? So please know that. Desire something that is eternal. Use your singlehood to serve the Lord. Well, you will have no regrets in eternity. Now, but now to the parents. Application, all right? Uh, okay, every time I look at father, then they look away, I will ask. All right, all right. pay you looked away quickly. So your child asks. Then you say, well, child, read properly, all right? You say, in this time. So daddy have answered the question. Then Isaac asks you, but daddy, so what should I learn? <laughs> Don't ask so many questions. <laughs> You can't use that, the purpose marriage. I already used that. <laughs> All right, while you think, Howard, all right, Caleb asked you, Dad, Daddy, then you say, Oh, this is about on earth. The manifold is on earth. If you interpret correctly, okay, you qualify first, all right? Right, very good. So you tell your child that, and this is the correct interpretation. Well, you get saved and then your family members may not be saved. They may even throw you out of the home, right? It happens to some. But don't be discouraged. In, in Christendom, you have many brothers and sisters in Christ. You are linked by the blood of Christ, all right? You have many brothers and sisters. Okay, then, then Caleb says, um, but daddy, I don't like so many brothers and sisters. <laughs> I just have Cornelius and I'm really frustrated already. <laughs> wow, it's been many for many, many of Cornelius at home every day. Daddy, I'll go crazy. What are you going to say? <laughs> don't be difficult. <laughs>
All right, so he said, well, brothers and sisters, Christian, and bro Christian brothers and sisters, they are there to encourage you, to help you walk with the Lord, to strengthen you. Okay? Now, very good. Now, parents, please, when you answer questions to your children, don't just un understand it and then answer it, answer the, give the technical answer. You're supposed to bring up godly seed. Knowing the answers does not mean they are going to be godly. Right? So explain think of the biblical application that God meant and explain it to them so that they don't just know the answer. They will embrace the application for their own lives. So that's very good. Yes, we will gain many brothers and sisters, even mothers, in this life, in this world. And the point is this. Now, please, please for example, if you, if you look at Luke chapter 18, Verses 28 to 30. Luke 18, 28 to 30. Now, Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. We have left all and followed you, Christ. Now, remember, this was immediately after the rich young ruler um, passage in Mark. We, I preached on that at the gospel meeting previous, previous Friday, the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler was not willing to leave his riches, right? He still had the idol of, of the love of riches. He would not turn to God. Those were still his gods. So he, went, he was not saved. So immediately Peter said, but what about us? You know, we left. We don't have those idols. We followed you. Now it could be the same as your child asking, wow, daddy, we're going to have a lot of houses on earth. Many brothers and sisters so many that I do not need to wash the plates anymore, right, Daddy? I can ask the other ones to wash at home. How are you going to teach them? Now, the point is this. When Christ said there'll be many, all right, he's talking about now, many of them, they left and they suffered persecution. And notice what God says. For, for me and for the kingdom of God's sake, for the kingdom of God's sake and early on he say for my sake and the gospel's sake in the mark account now the encouragement is yes we leave we have to make certain sacrifices when you became a christian life may become very difficult at home even your friends in school may may and at work may reject you we studied that this morning are you going to be discouraged now christ encouraged them by saying you are going to have many more and in the Bible, very often you would read, let, let me just read to you, all right? You can just copy it down. First Timothy 5.12, it said the elder women, the Christian treating the elder woman, having the elder woman, women, elder, elder women as mothers and younger as sisters. So you see, that is why sometimes we do call each other brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, because it's in the Bible, all right? I'm not saying if you don't call brother so-and-so, sister and so-and-so, you've seen, but you do that because of that, that kinship, that closeness. He said, brother, so-and-so. Because God says, yes, as mothers, as younger sisters. Now then, furthermore, um, in 1 Corinthians 4.15, now Paul says, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. You see, Paul sees himself as a father to them. And he said, there are many kind of people who want to be your teacher, your, 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 your father over you, but I'm a genuine one who's genuinely interested in your spiritual well-being. So we are in, as we always use the word, in a covenantal family. The moment you get saved, you're in a covenantal family. Now, there are two lessons that, yeah, well, the one that we stick on is what, what um, Howard rightly pointed out. Now, then it means this. Even as a, as a parent, when you read this, how do you view each other? How do you view each other? Christ said this to emphasize of the gain that people can have when they become Christians, the spiritual gain. Like Howard rightly pointed out, it's not, but they're going to wash your plate for you, you know. But it is the spiritual encouragement, the spiritual fellowship that you are going to have that will increase. Yes, you may feel very sad that you have left father and mother or they throw you out of the home. But you see, you gain spiritual brethren. And you must treasure 
spiritual brethren. That is the point. So the young ones, when you, have, when you come to church and you play with your brethren in the church, it's not just to play. You treasure them as spiritual brethren. Adults, do you treasure it? Do you treasure it? Now, COVID-19, many of the restrictions have been removed. We can travel again, right? We can travel again. Now, some Christians, they are raring to go. They say, I can't wait to go home, see my parents, see my siblings. Nothing wrong with that. Don't misunderstand me. Nothing wrong with that. But if our thinking, if our heart, having left home, whichever country that is, and God, by His will, brought you here, you live here, but if your thinking is still, those are my siblings, those are my parents, and those are the only ones I consider as my family. But God has moved you here. And you look at your brethren around you, the elderly, the young, you look at them like they are strangers or they are just people with no family affiliation and love and attraction. Then you don't understand it when Christ said, I call you to another land and I will give you many more brethren. You are going to have even mothers and fathers that will fawn over you, that will love you. Many more. So when we look at one another, now it should not be this as well. Sometimes in the past we say, why don't you go for church camp? We call church camp family camp, right? Family camp. So one rare time where you can spend almost a week together studying the Word of God together, playing together, fellowshipping together, encouraging one another in spiritual discussion and all that. It's called family camp. We don't like to call it church camp because it's your covenantal family that you're having a time together. But some will say, no, pastor, no, no. I say, why? You say, I'm saving all my leave to go back to see my family. I want to spend a few months there. Uh, where? Okay, Thomas, what's wrong with that? The desire, there is, no, there is no desire. There is no understanding that these, these are the replacements that God gave to me. Now, know this. I am not saying you should not go home. But a, f a whole month or two months, when camp is just a few days, and you say, no, not even that. Then you miss the whole point about God calling you here, God putting you here, and increase that spiritual brethren. It's very different. So number one, please don't live with that kind of attitude. You are just telling Christ, God, I'm so lonely here. I miss my family. I miss my family. Of course, we all miss our family. But we say it like as if the people that God added to your life is not family at all. They are just a burden and a problematic people in your life. You cannot reject that wonderful replacement that God brought into your life. And number one, now, number two. Now, therefore, begin to treat each other. Treat each other and treasure each other. Now, in a sense, even more. I remember one, one girl who just got saved um, a few years back. She got saved. And the rest of the family are non-believers or Roman Catholics. And she longed to come to church. She loved to come to church. She would stay back and hopefully can, can leave as late as possible. And one day she said, you know, it's so wonderful to be in church. I said, why? I don't have, I have brethren, I have sisters, I have parents at home, but they are unbelievers. They do not understand the joy that I have, the things that I want to talk about my Savior. They do not understand. Neither are they interested in talking about it. But in church, I have these brethren that is so different. I can tell them about how I feel about Christ. And I hear them talk about God. I can have conversations about my family, my Father in heaven, that only 
these blood-bought children, my covenantal siblings, can understand. So I, I really, from Mondays to, to Sundays, Tuesday night and Friday night is what I look forward to, to be with this family. Not that she hates her family, but she do not find that spiritual blessedness of these spiritual siblings. She don't see it. She don't find that. She treasured that. Now, I'm not saying we, re we reject and we ignore and we're not interested in our family. Not at all. All right? But we must not look down on the covenantal family and think like they are lowest priority. I don't really care. Everything in my life is about my family back home. All right? So we have to understand and remember that. Now, when we begin to really have that attitude, you will reap the benefit of that manifold that God puts into your life. Right? So, Cornelius, hey, Caleb, after you ask your daddy, and then your daddy just said all these things to you, what is your response? What will you think about? Now when I go to church, Yes. What, will I, what, what am I seeing my brethren as? I'm here to encourage them and I want them to be an encouragement to me. It's a spiritual engagement. Otherwise, it'll be just, well, wow, I got more brethren now. You know, when my birthday comes, I'm going to get a lot more present, right? Uh, young ones? Hey, you're my brethren. Where's my present? <laughs> No, you see everything now in a spiritual light. And when you understand that, you reap it because you change your interaction with one another. You increase in your love for the other. You look at the other person. God put this person in my life. I am out of my country, but this person is put into my life for me to love, for me to show brotherly kindness and charity. Not just to my own siblings at home. Not just to my own parents at home. That is why we encourage the young people to come for seniors' fellowship. They are, in that sense, your mothers and fathers, in that sense, right? To show them honour, to interact with them, encourage them, be encouraged by them, because it's a covenantal family. I hope that now you begin to see things differently. But there's another thing that I want to say before I move on to the next question. Well, actually, before that, remember we sing, Blessed be the ties that bind our hearts in Christian love. Blessed be the times that bind our hearts in Christian love. All right, so, so parents, please think about that and teach your children that. The like-mindedness, the unity of heart, you never find in unbelieving family members. Okay? Now, the other thing that we must learn is this. Now, Peter said we have left all, but Christ's emphasis in both accounts of the same event is left all um, for, for my sake and the Gospels in Mark. And in Luke, he said, um, for if you've left parents or brethren or wife or children, if you left them, he said, for kingdom of God's sake, for kingdom of God's sake, all right? Now, many may want to come to Perth, come to Australia, live in Australia, or may want to go live in wherever it is. Please don't quote this passage and say, well, you know, um, I, I want to do all this. And, but in your heart, it's because it is not for kingdom's sake. It is not for Christ's sake. It is because of what you want, your own stubborn will. Lord, I want to live in, in Australia because it's a far better life than whatever other country, my own country. Now, the Christian in this passage should learn. We go wherever God sends us because it is for his kingdom, his will. And when we are there, it is for his kingdom's work. It's not to go there and to have, now I join a church, I go to a church, it's another country. Well, this is a great life, right? Lots of Christian friends. We are always going out, playing, eating, um, so-called fellowshipping, having fun. That is all. No, this is about the kingdom's work. This is about God's work. All right, so have the right understanding. And I never forget one full-time worker. All right, this person served in a church for a long time, but over time it's revealed in the heart is this person just want, 
want to go to another country. At first, want to come to Australia, then later want to go to another country. All the while plotting and planning to go because it's a better life. It's not for the kingdom's work. It's not where God wants me to be, but it's for a better life. All right, now, next lesson. All right, we only have about 12 minutes for the next question. Now, the question goes like that. Many older people recommend playing mahjong. Those of you who do not know mahjong, it's a Chinese, it's not a card game, but it's a brick game, little bricks, all right? They shuffle around. Mahjong. Many older people recommend mahjong to make the mind active. Some adults also recommend poker. And once you know it's poker, Julius, what's poker? Good that you don't know. It's not taking a stick and poke people, all right? It's some card game. Card games. Some recommend poker and blackjack, another card game, for the same reason. What are the dangers in doing this? All right, so someone asked. Because it's very common. Just like when I was visiting an elderly, the person said, you know, this, this uh, Chonghua Association keeps coming to her home after Uncle Sito died and said, hey, Auntie Sito, come, come, come to our association. Go, come, we have mahjong games every day. Mahjong helps you to keep your mind active. All right? And or some, yes, some will tell you, play all this. Maybe young ones also. You obviously know this is not uh, a kid asking, all right? This uh, and a parent asking. So maybe your child asks you, Daddy, I want to play with this computer game and that computer game. All right? Is it all right? So the same principle applies. What do you think, parent? Parent. Uh, okay, Laura. All right? One of your child says, Mommy, can I play some of these card games or, or mahjong? I want to learn a cultural game to keep my mind active. What would you say? Say again. There are different ways of keeping your mind active. But they say, but a lot of people say that this is good. All right, then daddy comes in to the room. What? All right. John, what would you say? Not related to spiritual things. They do many non-spiritual things, <clears throat> in a sense. All right, depends what you mean by spiritual. I, I think I understand what you say, but when you say not spiritual, what do you mean? Because studying is not per se on surface a spiritual activity. All activities are spiritual in a sense. We have a spiritual purpose. Not spiritual means. Then they say, don't ask so many things. Not spiritual, go. <laughs> All right? But I think I know where you're going. And even this person who asks, what are the dangers? That's what the parents are saying. There are many things that you can do that may not expose you to certain dangers. Don't have to be this. Now, these, these are usually associated with gambling. All right? That, that is the point. Very often associated, the association is with gambling. That's why you say it's... it's not spiritual, it means it's, it's gambling associated, all right? How can you think about these things? All right, so number one, yes, we would not recommend, we would not encourage, and if people ask, we, would, we, we should tell our children or each other. Now, this, there are many ways to keep your mind active, but why choose things that are associated with gambling? What for, all right? And I do not, yeah. Now, so association. Now, so you just copy this verse. I'll read to you. 1 Corinthians 8.13. Now, oh, sorry, 1 Thessalonians 5.22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's a biblical principle. Now, think of this. When you're there, when you're playing, and another, other people who are non-Christians, they associate these things with gambling. All right? Typically. I won't say always, all right? And then they say, oh, you're a Christian. You tell us you're a Christian. Oh, Christians gamble as well. Appearance of evil, stumbling, causing potential problem for your witness. You may say, but, but pastor, I'll do all these things, but I won't, I won't put money on it. It doesn't matter. They do not know. 
They still see people collecting money. Oh, you don't want the money? All right. But they still see the appearance of evil. All right. Avoid it. Now, in fact, 1 Corinthians 8, 13, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. What happens if a weaker brother? Oh, maybe gambling is all right. Or maybe a weaker brother who used to be in these gambling things and say, well, playing without using money is all right. But understand the second principle, temptation. Temptation to yourself and you could stumble and cause another brother to be tempted. They play, they play without money and then slowly they go back to money, right? So association, temptation. Now what does God say in 1 Corinthians 10, 12? Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Now these are principles that you can apply to this question and any other question, all right, teens? If you see a computer game that your friend plays, Would you play it? What is the association? What is the temptation for you? But you say, well, they are not sinful things. It's just like, you know, um, uh, just water. Water bottles pouring on each other, right? Some of these advertisements, like, pour water, pour water, and pour different color water, and try to fill the bottle with the same color water. It's not sinful or anything. All right, so I ask Cornelius. Oh, keep asking the same thing. Maybe I ask Elim, all right, Elim? They say, but daddy is just pouring water. There's no association or anything evil or anything in your mind. Or maybe your friends tell you that. Ah, Elim is just this. Would you want to play it? Straight away, you say, oh yeah, it's not sinful. No? Why? Give a reason. You might become you might become what? Thirsty. <laughs> you might become addicted. Is that what I say? Addicted. I might become addicted. Yes, it may not be something sinful, but I just can't put it down. Addiction. All right? So whatever you choose, be careful. You say, I, I won't fall. But God says, be careful. So the choice of things. Now, I'm not saying that we cannot do anything then. All right? But always have these principles in the foremost of your mind. Remember that. Now, what about the time that you spend? Ask yourself that. What it is. The mahjong game. I don't play mahjong, so try to find out. Anyone have played mahjong before? How many hours does it take? Okay, uh, Claude. How many hours? Uh, not asking you to confess. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying, how, how, how many hours is it typically a mahjong game? <laughs> not, I played a few times. Three, four hours. Three or four hours, all right? So about there, I check the internet, they say two to three hours. All right, so you must not be a good mahjong player, all right? Four hours. All right, they take turns to, to take turns to, to so-called uh, lead it and so on. A number, amount of hours. So if there is something that you want to do to, to, to work your brain, don't choose something that will take so much time, right? Right? So some of the questions to ask. Then what about friendships? I think someone said, who do you play this with? Now typically people want to play this unbelievers. Most of the Christians say, I stay away from these things. Appearance of evil. They rope you in. Then you're among them. How much? Three or four hours with unbelievers. I know what some of you say, right? What, what will you say, Jonathan? Well, I share the gospel. <laughs> they are captive with me for three, four hours of gospel sharing. How would you answer that? I think most people won't do that. Well, you can try, but the good thing is, most likely after that one game, you will not be invited back, right? right? So you're still not going to have that to, to work on your brain. Right, the friendships that you, the thing that you, the things that you'll be talking about, even not sinful things, who you spend that many hours with to, to strengthen your brain. But what are you talking about? What are you doing? What will they be talking about? So now many of these things are problems. So it is not just mahjong, poker, blackjack. Anything that the Christian wonder about. 
Think about these, applica- these principles, all right? These principles. So addiction. Um, now, so still the child asks, but daddy, I want to strengthen my brain. Okay, then I ask another parent. No, ask, yeah, another, or ask a child, ask children, ask teens. Um, Jemima, are you able to answer? To your, all right, Jemima. All right. So, Josiah asked you that. All right? And you're still trying to catch your breath. All right? Recovering from your illness, trying to catch your breath, and you will explain to Josiah. What are some options you will give to Josiah for him to strengthen his brain? I know you say, help me to cook, I know. <laughs> and help me to do some housework. There are some puzzles. There are some puzzles that you can play with, right? Puzzles, you play on your own, something that you can do your own. Now, I, I do some of this, all right? At one time, I found that my, my brain kind of like struggled with focusing, which is not good for preaching. So I, I downloaded Mastermind. Because when I was young, I played Mastermind. I played with my mother. Right? My mother is not here. I don't think Sharon wants to play with me. But the good thing today in Mastermind is computer form. You play against the computer, all right? So I do some of that. And it's quick, all right? It does teach you to focus, help you to focus, think logically. Um, I've stopped doing that, all right? Anyway, but... Yes, there are puzzles, there are some of these things, short time, that help you focus. That's fine. So don't think of something that, is, that has association problems, that has how much time you spend, the temptation problems, and all that. Yeah, there are other options. What else? Lastly, quickly, pay. Oh, uh, um, Sarah, what else would you recommend? Okay, pay say, uh, now this, I think I'm growing old. Memory failing me. Uh, wife, forget your name even. So, what wife? I'm Sarah, <laughs> right? Uh, wife, they say, Sarah, you forgot my name, right? They say, then what would you recommend him to do? Memory. Say again. Memory. memory verse, memorize verses, right? Go do memory verse with our boy, <laughs> right? Memory verses. Now turn to. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. We studied this for many months, or was it years? Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Now we went through this entire series. Now let's, let's read together. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. What does God tell us to occupy our minds with? Scriptures. Well, many of these things here, obviously. Where can you get the definition of all these things? Scriptures. Yes, memorize the Word of God. Memorizing the Word of God makes you use your mind a lot more than you think. All right? You got the the sequence wrong. You missed out certain words, and then you try again. Yes, you can use that. Now, know this. The protection of our mind is not through these games. You must know the protection of our minds is through God. Yes, some of these things, human responsibility-wise, can help you. But please don't think that you need those things to the point where I say, even if it's association with evil, even if we stumble people, even if it's sinful, I'll just do it because I need my mind to be clear when I'm old or for me to take exams. Don't do that. Trust that the Lord is the one that keeps your mind. Now, Mrs. Arnott, right up to the very last breath of her life, all these months that when we visit her, she, her mind, when it comes to things spiritual, when it comes to things, she's very clear. I showed her pictures of our extension, and months later, she remember. She remembers. So many of you visit her, you know, at times, yes, she may be forgetful, but she remembers a lot of things very clearly, scriptures and hymns. Did she have 
so many years in the nursing home play with these things? No. She was always in bed, praying, memorizing scriptures. She always have a Bible with her. To the point where she cannot have it anymore, her mind was still clear. It's God, number one. And if you use your mind for scriptures, God will help. And if God chooses to make you have certain diseases that your memory fails, then so be it. All right, so please don't come to a point where you say, I must, my mind is so important, I'll do even sinful things to keep it going. Now, at the end of the day, we have to search our hearts. Sometimes questions like that is, some Christians, they just want to play those things. Of course, not this person, he says that it's dangerous. Do we really want to obey God? Teens, you tell daddy and mom, I must play this kind of game, must play that kind of game. It's good for me. You tell your wife or you tell your husband. Is it really because of that or is this a desire, an addiction? All right? What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts, uh, what church dropouts say, why they stop attending church. Now, please remember 66% of, well, I take the American view, um, they're the most readily available results. They stop attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from